This is Mommying While Muslim, recorded live and unedited. Watch as Zeba and Uzma record their podcast. See their reactions and find out for yourself what all the buzz is about. Assalamu everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mommy Old Muslim Podcast. This is Uzma Jaffrey. And this is Zeba Hassan. And I get to see you two times in one week. Like that is I know. a bonus for me. That is. That's crazy awesome because we only ever get to text or WhatsApp. Like, got to do this, bullet points. But yeah, exactly. two days of talking is fun. I feel like we're going to catch up on a lot. <laughs> T- definitely. So how, what did you think about our Daddy Day episode yesterday? I think... Um, you were the only person that didn't cry. Am I am I right? Yeah, and I, I didn't cry. It was all you Why guys. were we all like crying? <laughs> I heard I like retrograde or something was in the in the air and like the summer soul. Like, I don't know. I just heard oh. that there was some energy in the air. So I was just bawling like a was baby. It summer solstice. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that's it what it was. Oh my God. I just, just looked at that. So yeah, there was a lot of weird energy in the universe and it just manifested <laughs> itself in um, crying people on um, Facebook. So I just, I definitely want to, because I don't have a cute cry. I have an ugly cry and I'm just not even going to pretend otherwise. I so, thought it was cute. So did you guys finish packing or you're in the process of packing? You're almost done? Still in the process, girl. Like, oh God, you know, girl. I went up to a point and I think by like, eight o'clock last night, I was done. I was ready to veg in front of the couch. So that's what I did. And that's kind of what we're doing with the kids right now is just vegging in front of the couch and watching Green you Arrow. Have to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, Green Arrow is yeah. a good one. That's a good show. It's a good that's one. It's really than... not appropriate for kids. You know, no, I, it's I think not. Flash is way better for kids. Oh, but you know, once they started doing the multi-dimensional, I'm marrying this person, like it lot, we lost interest in that. Mm-hmm, like my brain mm-hmm. couldn't quite keep up, but yeah, we're definitely That's big. That's what my Marvel husband fans. says. Yeah. We're like, well, I'm done. <laughs> I, I can suspend sense. belief in reality to some degree, but when you start talking about you're going to come back and marry this person and that's the mom. So like, many I worlds. Yeah, yeah. I can't keep, I can barely keep track of my own world right now. So I'm just not going to do that. But right. um, I'm so glad we were able to talk to our dads on Father's Day. I know my dad texted me afterwards and was just so mm. thankful and grateful to be able to chit chat with us. And, that's great. you know, all these things are like th- mini therapy sessions is what I say. Like we're, we're learning, growing, and, and really recognizing our parents for being people and not just our parents. And I think that that's very important mm-hmm. to, to recognize. But I do want to get into our soapbox for today because I know you have quite a good one. So lay it on us. I know. Month. I know. I just couldn't um, streamline this. So I wanted everybody, including myself, to pay attention to blackmail quote unquote suicides by hanging. So FYI, suicide by hanging only happens in Bollywood or in, if you read the book or watch the, I think it's on Netflix or Amazon, A Man Called Ovi. It is hella hard to try to hang yourself, especially outdoors off a tree. All right. This is just typical American lynching that's happening, but for whatever reason, the KKK has never made counter violence and extremism. We have a whole department in our government called counterviolence and extremism um, or the department of homeland under the department of homeland security oh there's this initiative for cve but you know who tops the list it's not the white dudes it's not the kkk who's been doing this for hundreds of years you know who is on their uh list muslim people and like black people and that's been forever and a half but they've never killed hundreds and hundreds of people like the kkk is so what is it going to take my question is um Is that because there's only one type of terrorist that we want to stop in this country? And my second question is, what's it called again when you have different rules for different types of people? So answer those two and riddle me that. The second thing I uh, want us to realize is that, you know, I know there's a lot of balls in the air and a lot is happening. And so some of the things we don't, unless we really take the time to read it, Uh, and understand it and maybe talk to a few people, it's not going to make sense. So I kept hearing like, the president has fired a U.S. attorney, the president has fired a U.S. attorney, why is this such a big deal? Well, um, he did, and it was U.S. attorney Jeffrey Berman, he's out of the Southern District of New York, and it's so convoluted, so complex, you need really dark, strong coffee and a whiteboard to figure out what the heck happened. So 
bottom line, if you want to summarize, summarize it, for those of us who thought separate but equal, our three branches of government are there so that nobody encroaches on the other, guess what? Rude awakening. They can. Absolutely. The president can interfere in the independent practice of our lawyers who are doing some important work. And I never thought I would say this about a lawyer, but I can... I feel like this particular lawyer is, yeah, and no offense to your husband, <laughs> but, but uh, I forgot for a second. Uh, but this particular lawyer, Jeffrey Berman, has been involved in some high profile cases, some really important cases that put away some really bad people. So it makes me think that his political alignment, he actually deals with it separately and apart from his work, from his legal work, which I can respect a lot because I'm not anti a political party. I'm anti people that align with a political party and are jerks and don't protect the rights of people. But I feel like this guy did. Um, basically what happened is the attorney general of the United States, which is like the highest legal office in this country, could not fire this guy because he had been brought in temporarily and then unanimously approved by a particular court. And so, you know, it was wonderful. Everything was good. But he started investigating. Well, he investigated first Michael uh, Michael Cohen. Um, now he's investigating Rudy Giuliani. You know the person, uh, the president's personal lawyer, who is involved in the whole Ukraine, you know, scandal. So basically, the attorney general could not fire him, and so the president did. He was like, "Oh, I had the president fire you," but the president is in cam on camera. And like in print saying, no, I had nothing to do with it. So we need to figure out how this egregious exercise of a legal precedent, a very obscure legal precedent from 1979 was enacted now. Because now, today in 2020, this legal precedent has been set going forward. And the president of the United States can, um, uh, you know, appoint other judges at uh, levels of court where it makes a difference to you and me. Like this is super duper important. So if a president can fire and hire attorneys uh, based on who will do what he wants and who will do what his friends want, what is it called when a leader doesn't want laws to apply equally to all of its citizens? Um, and I think that's really important. And again, look up the, uh, the cases that this guy has been involved in. It's amazing. He's the one that helped put Jeffrey Epstein, the child molester, away. You know, the whole Russian lawyer and what did uh, Trump and his son and everybody know before the elections in 2016. These are all super important cases. So take a look. Um, know what's going on and ask the right questions and ask your representatives like what what the heck like is this going to continue and what laws do we need to enact to keep the president's sticky hands out of the other branches of our government that's our soapbox for today that was quite a soapbox so it's i scary, definitely right? it is it definitely is scary it's it's one of those things that you read in theory and you're <laughs> kind of like not understanding how it all is put together and then you're like, wait a second, we really need to be informed. Um, and that's just a perfect segue because one of the quotes that uh, of the book that we read, um, and I, it was literally, I just want to read this. It was to educate a man is to educate an individual, but to educate a woman is to educate an entire family. And uh, that literally stood out to me um, from this book, um, being Muslim, a cultural history of women in color in American Islam. And we are so blessed today to have the author, Dr. Sylvia Chan Mullick, um, who who holds a PhD in ethnic studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MFA from Mills College in creative writing. She's an associate professor in American histories and in women and gender studies at Rutgers University. Her research focuses on the history of Islam in the United States, specifically Muslim American women and the rise of Islamophobia post 9-11. Like how do the intersections of race, gender, and religion work to promote social justice? And what are the acts of, um, um, kind of like going against the grain of society and how that can actually help, you know, the, the show signs of resistance and moving the social justice forward. So we are super blessed to have you here today. Um, and I know I love watching your, your garden grow on Facebook. So we can bring you back for another podcast for that. But thank you and welcome, Dr. Sylvia Chan-Melek. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today. 
Assalamualaikum. Well, thank you. Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum to everyone watching. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a privilege and an honor and to listen to uh, your soapbox today. There's a lot going on now. And so it's it's an exciting time to be in conversation about what it means to be Muslim, what it means to be a Muslim woman in this moment. So I appreciate the chance to be here with you. Absolutely. We're just super excited and we're going to dive right in and find out a little bit about your family background and your mom's story. Mm -hmm. that, that would be great. So do you want me to dive right in? Oh, well, yes. you're, you're going to know. <laughs> we're not going to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll know when it's time to tell you my mom's story. Okay. Yeah. So, so who, so how many kids do you have? Um, where are you located right now? What is your philosophy to parenting as a Muslim American? Um, you know, and not necessarily what people would consider a traditional Muslim American in America. Like, how do you think that shapes you? And can you tell us a little bit about your, fa your, your family and your, your family journey? So I would say, first of all, um, that in almost every way I, I, I don't think I have chosen a path that has had precedence for me to look to for how to be Muslim. So to just answer the basic questions, um, I have three children, three daughters, um, a stepdaughter uh, who is almost 22. She'll be 22 this year. Um, and then a 14 year old and a 12 year old. So I have been in quarantine with uh, two, well, <laughs> two teenagers, one teenager and one tweenager, which is been fun. Uh, we can it's talk a about challenge. that. <laughs> it's a challenge. Uh, sure a lot is. of lot, a lot of hormones in the house right now. Mm. Um, and I am in Central New Jersey. Um, uh, I, I teach at Rutgers New Brunswick, as you said, so we're located not far from there. But I am originally from California, from the Bay Area. Um, so we moved out here about eight years ago. Um, so so in general, and so uh, kind of an important um, kind of context for thinking about um, how I, as your as your you know podcast is called Mommy While Muslim, is that we are an intercultural, interethnic, interracial Muslim family. My husband is an African second generation African American Muslim. I am a convert to Islam who converted shortly after 9/11, and I can tell you a little bit, a bit about later um, about you know how that occurred. Um, I come from a Chinese immigrant family. Uh, who, whose parents did not know very much about Islam or Muslims other than what, you know, most of mainstream America sees on the news. Um, so I married into a family that had very strong cultures and traditions around being Muslim. And I was trying to figure out how to be Muslim myself in a post 9-11 moment, also coming from a fairly progressive liberal upbringing in the Bay Area where I had been an activist and someone who had been very involved in anti-racist and feminist advocacy and activism for a long time. So I brought all of this into uh, my own experience of becoming Muslim, being Muslim, and now mommying while Muslim. So I would say that my approach to how to raise these kids as Muslim is highly improvisational. Um, it, and <laughs> it's exactly. highly improbable. Yeah, it's highly, <laughs> yeah, and, and I would make it up as we go along. I would say that's the case for everyone, right? Absolutely, but, you know, 100%. but in terms of thinking about, but it's really pushed me to dig deep about what that means, what it actually means, uh, to raise our children as Muslims in the United States in this particular moment. And so, you know, it kind of all ties together. Um, my research, um, my life, my children, et cetera. I kind of all think about it in a very holistic frame um, of how to, you know, as as seamlessly and as gracefully as we can meld the, um, you know, cultural, emotional, psychological, spiritual, and physical aspects um, of this beautiful, vast religion called Islam into our daily lives. See, that's what I was wondering when I was reading this book. And granted, you know, Zeba and I both discussed, we were like, this is very much a textbook. Um, and so, again, you know, whiteboard and strong coffee, 
kind of, you know, reading and understanding. And, you know, just, I had to every few pages put it down because mind blow, mind blow. Like I could actually hear explosions of neurons, like going, oh my gosh, I actually grew. Um, we know they don't regenerate, but still. Um, I, I was wondering what prompted your partic this particular topic for you. So your summary right now just really makes so much more sense to me. I get it. So thank you for that explanation. But I know a lot of people, when they read the title of this podcast, when um, if they pick up your book or peruse your book a little bit, what they may be wondering, and um, I think they're probably wondering too, is feminism and Islam, are they compatible? And I think you kind of allude to that in the book, but, you know, I mean, as a professor in um, uh, several departments, uh, including uh, women and gender studies, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about that a little bit, because this may be news to you. It was certainly news to Zeba and I, but the majority of our listeners are actually non-Muslim women. Wow. That, mm -hmm. that, that is Surprise. amazing. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that's beautiful, you know, and 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 really, you know, refreshing in a way too. Um, though it would be wonderful also to have Muslim women across, you know, all cultures and ethnicities and races watching as well. But I mean, I think it's 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 interesting to note that being a mother is something that people find interesting um, mm -hmm. while you're Muslim. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But in response to your question, I mean. So people ask me a lot. I mean, so I'll, I, I mean, I, I, I like to acknowledge the obvious. You know, I will do talks about the book. I've written a book called Being Muslim. I am a specialist on the history of Islam and Muslims in the United States. I teach courses on it. I speak on it. Um, and so when people see me, right, in the body I'm in, as I often teach my students, we move around the world with the bodies that we're in, with the knowledges that we have, from you know the family and the communities that we're raised in, people don't exactly make that connection. Like that, oh, she's Muslim and she's writing about Muslims and how is she, you know, it doesn't quite add up, right? And so, you know, kind of knowing this and being very aware of it was something that um, kind of influenced my thought process around these terms that you mentioned, Islam, feminism, gender and race, from the very beginning. So I am a scholar of race and ethnicity. My um, PhD is in ethnic studies. Like I said, I'd long been a activist and advocate around issues of anti-racism in the Bay Area where I'm from. And so I came to Islam when I started studying it in the post 9-11 moment because I wanted to see what was going on. There was hate crimes, there was violence being directed at the Muslim community. And I was very interested in kind of working with the community, trying to advocate and do that work. And I quickly realized that a lot of the knowledge that I had around issues of race and gender that I had learned in my studies um, and my work were very applicable to this community. But when engaging with the community, there was almost like a little bit of defensiveness or resistance to talking about these topics at times, right? And, and what I realized is that we get caught up on words a lot. Um, like you said, Islam and feminism, people think, oh, do those things even go together? Well, if you take away the word feminism and you just think about the fact that Muslim women have been here in this country, in the United States, and we can talk a little more about you know, that particular history in a moment, but that Muslim women have been here holding communities together, raising children, working, not because they wanted to, but because you know, out of sheer necessity, and doing this type of work, if not for decades, then centuries, you, know, you don't have to call it feminism, but it is absolutely you know, women's agency, women's strength, you know, empowerment that women bring to these communities, right? And so, so, you know, you put the name feminism on it and it has all of these connotations. But as a scholar, I look at feminism as a, as a broad tent, you know, something that encompasses larger movements uh, for these types of things, for empowerment for women, um, for equal access and rights 
you know, and I feel like Islam is perfectly compatible with that. I don't see anything in my own engagement with the Quran and Hadith um, and the histories and traditions of Islam that contradict that in any way. So, you know, in my own approach, this is how I've kind of gone about the thinking. I, I think we get caught up on semantics and words a lot about uh, what is what and what is what. But if we really look at it in a broad holistic sense of how people have lived and how they have gone about their daily lives as Muslims, I think it's absolutely compatible. And I think there's absolutely this spirit of what I call gender justice within the history of Muslim women in the United States. I love that's, that answer. I feel like it's yeah. so supremely complete, you know? And <laughs> you took a lot of pains in your book to define terms and say, this is how I'm going to proceed to discuss this and call this. So it eliminates a lot of that confusion. And we can come back to the term feminism versus womanism later, but I think Zeba has a question for you. Yeah, sure. the, you you touched upon this a little bit, and we actually um, were fortunate enough to have a guest last week on our sh our podcast. Um, sadly, I was recovering from an endoscopy, so I didn't get to speak with her myself. But I definitely watched in my post uh, my post haze um, post um, endoscopy and <laughs> anesthesia. Um, she heard anesthesia. I was like, "What's going on? I need to listen to this." But her name was Ikhlas Lalim, and she was part of Identity Politics um, podcast, mm. right, Uzma? And yes. she was specifically like again another mind blowing situation. Who 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 literally said, you know, you all, in, in fairness, are, are products of an immigrant culture of a Muslim immigrant that came here, you know, in the 60s and 70s. But she's like, you know, we've been Amer Muslim Americans have been here for centuries. And you really did touch upon that in your book. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. Like they've been a part of the the, the moral, the, the structure of building of this country. And we kind of through that concept of black erasure, erased some of their the impact of that so mm -hmm. you talk a lot about like the the nation of islam specifically which again when you talk about words having meaning that kind of gives a you know louis farrakhan um negative connotation to a lot of people that don't understand what the the organization is about so my question to you is one you you mentioned them a lot in your book and i and i'd like to um and they were an integral part of history for sure but what do you feel their role played in shaping um, the structure of modern day American Muslim society? Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you so much. I mean, that's a really wonderful question. And Ikla, uh, Iklas from Identity Politics, it's an amazing uh, podcast. And they really kind of emphasize these issues um, and conversations and debates, you know, um, around race in Muslim communities and really highlighting that African-American Muslim experience, which I think is so integral. So, you know, here's my segue, so integral to actually understanding what it means to say you are Muslim in American society. So a dear friend of mine, um, Dr. Donna Austin, um, and I wrote an article uh, together. Um, I think it was published last year. And we were thinking about what it means to be uh, an Afri a Black Muslim. Like, what is a Black Muslim ethical imperative? And one thing that she says, and that I cite rather often, is that Islam first entered this country as a large-scale presence, right? through the bodies of enslaved Africans. So mm -hmm. anywhere, scholars estimate that anywhere between one third to one fifth, so it's very hard you know, to have an exact number um, for enslaved peoples coming into this country, but anywhere from one third to one fifth of enslaved Africans who were forcibly brought to the United, to, to, the, to the Americas were from West Africa, from uh, Muslim, predominantly Muslim countries. So it is you know, pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, fair to say that anywhere from one fifth to one third of enslaved peoples here were Muslim, right? So, so whether or not we as a nation, you know, kind of recognize those enslaved peoples as Muslims, their presence in this country was the way in which Islam became an American religion, right? Because enslaved peoples came, they still tried to practice their records. There mm -hmm. are uh, rituals, religious rituals. There are documentation, there's documentation of this, you know, um, enslaved peoples who, you know, were literate and wrote out prayers in Arabic, you know, um, and people who were trying to fast and do their daily prayers um, and facing a certain way when they prayed and preparing food. And, you know, you know, the list goes on and on. 
So whether or not we recognize this presence or not, and as a cultural historian, someone who studies, you know, the history of culture, these presences live on in our national consciousness. And so with that presence, with Islam being so deeply intertwined with the history of black people um, and that culture and legacy, right? Donna, uh, Dr. Donna Austin says that can never be intertwined. That is still with us to this day, right? And in the American imaginary within kind of how America thinks about Islam, if you, you know, I'm sure this has all occurred to you, like, why is there this extreme kind of, you know, kind of triggered reaction that so many Americans have, you know, at the mere mention of Islam and Muslims. And one of the particular things about its presence in a U.S. context is that Islam is an inexorably um, uh, kind of non-white, non-Christian religion that history is intertwined with the history of blackness in this country, right? So I just wanna make that point that whether or not we acknowledge it or not, that presence exists, right? So that's, that's integral to understanding what it means to be Muslim in the United States. It's intertwined with blackness yeah. and the history of black people and black culture and communities. So the nation of Islam is something that's become a sort of boogeyman of sorts, right? To, to kind of think, oh, those are the bad Muslims. And there, you know, and there have been very problematic things that, you know, Louis Farrakhan has said. But when you think about prior to the 1970s, if you actually met a Muslim in the United States, if there was actually a person that you met who was Muslim, they would very likely, almost, you know, almost, you know, uh, definitely be African American. And many African American Muslims did not come through the Nation of Islam, as as I talk about in my book. There were other mm -hmm. um, movements, the Moorish Science Temple, the Ahmadiyya movement, Dar al Islam. Um, there were Orthodox Sunni uh, Muslims, Black Muslims as well, right? But the Nation of Islam was the one that was catapulted into the mm -hmm. national spotlight, and so their images became conflated with being Muslim. Again, once again, in the in the in the national consciousness, right? So what I'm trying to argue, I, I don't make arguments about you know who's an authentic Muslim, like this is authentic, this is orthodox, this is not orthodox. I'm trying to think about when people say the word Muslim in this country, what do they mean, right? And so when you know up until the 1960s or 70s, when they said I met a Muslim, or when the newspaper said Muslim, they were talking about black Muslims in the nation of Islam, you know, people who were um, critiquing white supremacy, people who were rejecting um, Christianity because of its particular notions of race, right? Rejecting this way and trying to claim it as a um, tradition uh, of black liberation, right? And so the nation of Islam is so important because first of all, you know, kind of maybe first and foremost, the most famous Muslims most Americans know are Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And they both come out of that tradition, you know, they both are connected with that organization in some way. And so when we start thinking about what it means to be Muslim, what is a Muslim tradition in the United States, they are at the very heart of it. And their practices of, you know, kind of having their own diet, having their own industries, having um, kind of a very strong critique of racism in this country. I think those are all things that Muslims now in the contemporary moment, whether they are aware of it or not, are realizing are necessary to be Muslim in this country. You know, that you have to have a critique of racism that you have to have very strong kind of internal community relations, um, that, you know, that we have our own um, dietary laws and industry around that. You know, the Nation of Islam already did all that. So they're just so critical um, in understanding how, the, you know, those that came before us had already constructed a way of being Muslim in this country that I think we can learn so much from. You know, again, yeah. without, you know, all the conversations, you know, are they real Muslims? Well, you know what? They were they were the Muslims in this mm -hmm. country. And and and, you know, we can look at what they did and their practices and find a lot to draw from and learn from as Muslims in the 21st century. Right. And, you know, whether or not 
you know, again, labels and what we call ourselves may matter, but that's a whole different discussion outside of what you're talking about, which is pure history. And, you know, who was here and who was represented, represented. And I found myself um, mind blown at, um, I forget the name of the documentary that you cited, uh, The Hate That Hate Creates. Oh, The Hate. Uh, oh, gosh, I can't believe I'm, I'm blanking. I'm having a moment. It was a documentary uh, the hate, in the 60s. Oh, the Hate That Hate Produced. The Hate That the Hate, hate, produced. The hate Produced. 1958. So it was, 1958. So that was released. Yeah. And that's how America first learned about Muslims. And yes, it was primarily Nation of Islam. And so that in and of itself, you know, the um, images of the women and uh, the structures that were within this organization, this very tightly run ship, scared the heck out of white people, you know, and mm -hmm. that's where they, I, I was thinking, is that where they associated oh, women are docile and women are subjugated in Islam. And Islam means all these terrible things, including a threat to our capitalistic structure because they're creating their own infrastructure, mm -hmm. a threat to our nice, tight 1950s um, planned communities, our, what were they called? Ranch houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they're threatening all of it because they're organizing. And if we don't squash this now, then they're going to rise up because they're talking about liberating and all people are equal. And I, and it, I didn't realize there was a documentary that was produced on such a level and that Life magazine and People magazine had done these spreads on the Muslims that were there at the time, which was Nation of Islam, and it scared the hell out of everybody. And that's mm -hmm. where I realized when I, because I wore my hijab too after 9-11. No, I was already wearing it at 9-11. Um, I think the year prior I wasn't. And then um, immediately people were like, oh, did you get married? Did your husband make you do that? <laughs> and it always blew my mind, you know, like, yeah. why do people, oh, you must be married because you wear the hijab. Wait, why does, why do those two go together? I don't understand. And so the history that you document and talk about, it explained that to me, like, oh, this is a generational problem. Like whoever saw it in 1958 probably talked to their kids about it and that got passed on to grandkids and then came to me, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I was really appreciative for, for that reflection, for that piece of history. Um, mm -hmm. When we're talking about, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's too broad a topic to talk about how do we get rid of that. Uh, so let's go to a less broad topic and talk about how um, or what the next steps are for us as women and as moms toward racial justice. Hmm. I know it's a total well, that, like tongue in cheek. I know it's, it's just a, as big a topic, if not bigger. <laughs> well, you know, I, I actually, I, I think about this a lot and I actually, I wrote another essay. Um, it's collected in this anthology called with stones in our hands edited by um, uh, professor Sohail Dalatsai and Junaid Rana. And I wrote an essay about, I can't remember what it was called. It was about parenting my two daughters after tr the Trump election. Right. Mm -hmm. And the and the essay was about how one of my, my younger daughter, who I think was around oh eight at the time when the election happened, and they and they were talking about putting Muslims in camps. I don't right. I don't know if you remember. I mean maybe we you remember. Probably, <laughs> you remember, right? And I and, and a few nights my eight year old um came into our bedroom like in absolute like terror, in tears, saying, Mommy, are they gonna are they gonna put us in jail? And and maybe they won't put us in jail because we don't look Muslim, but are they gonna put my nana, my mother-in-law, in jail? Are they gonna put, you know, my aunties and uncles in jail? Right. And so so there there was this, you know, this this actual, you know, how you feel as a mom when your kid mm -hmm. says things to you like that, or when we're riding in the car and we're going to school and they're talking about the Christchurch massacre um on the on the radio, right? And, and they're listening to that. And, and you imagine their little brains trying to process this, right? And so on top of my own political commitments to racial justice, to you know, anti-religious bigotry, all of this, I just have this incredible protective maternal instinct where I just want to beat down Everybody, <laughs> you know, we are all her, there. She's our right? sister. <laughs> like, how dare you? How dare you put these things in my child's mind? How dare you? And then on top of that, like I said, 
you know, coming from, uh, you know, the, my, my husband being African American and myself being a Chinese American um, child of immigrants whose father was a refugee, you know, all of these things, you know, kind of come into how I think about how to raise them and how to, you know, kind of send them off in, in the world to be the kind of, you know, to have the resiliency to withstand so much distortion, so much misleading information. I always point out to audience and students, students that I talk to, you know, you can name probably every single stereotype there is about Islam and Muslims. And you can use this for any racial, you know, a marginalized group, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, Native Americans. You can probably name every single stereotype about all of these groups that we all understand and know and can you know agree upon. But what do you actually know about the history of this group? What do you actually know about who they are and the complexities of their communities and you know the ways in which we are all just striving to live our lives in the best way possible for our families, for our communities, you know, for the future? We don't know anything. And so to answer your question, the thing I usually say is, and this is why I do the work I do, why I teach the classes, why I wrote this book, I, I think for me, being someone, being someone who is a writer and a teacher and a scholar and who just, you know, I feel like it's so important to understand where we come from, what is informing our ideas, what is informing the, the landscape, you know, the cultural landscape, the political landscape, the social landscape of everything around us so that we can say, hey, you know, to, to be a Muslim woman in this country in this moment requires you to have a strong commitment, you know, to um, anti-racist practice, a strong commitment to social justice. It requires this of you because Ultimately, it is what will keep you well, kind of grounded in who you are and give you a sense of purpose in that identity, right? And, and the reason why I called the book Being Muslim is because it's a practice. It's something we have to do every day. It's not yes. just something we can just say. It's not an identity that we just, oh, I'm Muslim. Well, what does that mean? You right. know, what does that mean? Okay. Oh, and what does it mean beyond, you know, like, a, you know, we, we pray, we fast, um, you know, we do our rituals with our communities and things like that. But what does that mean in our life? And so, you know, I, I think the response that I always have is that you are part of creating this narrative. You, we are in a moment where we are rejecting the mainstream narratives that are built on white supremacy and violence and the marginalization of so many people. We are in a moment where we're seeing statues toppling, where we see people saying, you know, no more. This is not who this country is. It, the, people of color have always been here. Muslims have always been here. You know, African-Americans, Native peoples built this country in so many ways and are not acknowledged. We need new narratives and we need to find those and we need to tell those and share those. And I think those give people strength. You know, those yeah. give people resilience and fortitude to move through the very difficult work of creating the world we actually want to live in, right? For our kids together, right? Yeah. Um, you know, how Muslims that. can can connect to other groups, right? We have to imagine it before we can make it and then live in it, right? Yeah. And you can't imagine Absolutely. it if you don't. And I always tell my kids, like, I wrote this book for you guys. Yes. I wrote this book for you because, because what I found so challenging all the time was like, I don't have any mentors. Who can mm -hmm. I ask, you know, how to do a lot of things, how, how to raise my kids, how to be in my marriage? Like, I don't know how to do this. Right. And, and, and I actually found that I did have mentors, you know, these women that I write about. I talked to so many women. And I said, you know, they did this all before me. I, I, I don't have to feel like that. I'm not alone at all. And they had so much more, you know, in terms of challenges. You know, I'm so privileged and so blessed compared to some of the hardships they endured um, to be Muslim. Right. So, so I, I kind of use that. I mean, it gives me a lot of strength. And I think, 
you know, it's my hope, inshallah, that I always say to my kids, they're like, oh, mom, it's so boring, all those academic books you read. But I say, well, maybe, <laughs> inshallah, someday. Maybe inshallah. You'll, you'll they'll, understand. I, They'll understand. They'll understand. But I wrote, I wrote it for you, you know? Um, yeah. So I mean, well, you, you dedicated not... it to them, so they should know. Just read your names yeah. in the front, <laughs> on the front right there. Just, they're not um, alone. They're not alone. Yeah. Yes. We're not alone. Right. We're not alone. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we want everybody, whether you're a non-Muslim mom or a Muslim mom or however you identify, like motherhood is a universal language. We all have the same struggles. It may be a little bit more when you have a certain, when you're marginalized. And, you know, when you're talking about, I, I believe I've read your essay with stones in her hand. Um, and for Zeba and myself, it's really important to, to, talk about those who are really on the margins. So the margins of the margins, the minorities within minorities. And that's important for us as Muslim moms, because if we're not going to pick up stones and defend them, who will, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's important to us. And we know we're going to get a lot of criticism for it going down the line. We haven't brought those topics here yet, but they're, you know, in the pipes and we're working on it <laughs> because inshallah, you know, but like you said, the stories of everybody matters and understanding them historically, socially, um, within context is more important than the, how we want to put them in boxes and how we want to separate them. Um, and how we want to, I guess, continue some of the cultural approaches to them, which may not be American and may certainly be un-Islamic. So um, stay tuned for some of that uh, when we're talking about narratives. Oh, but awesome. yeah. yeah, we're excited. Go ahead, Zeba. No, I just, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Zeba. Oh, no, 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 I mean, I just wanted to, to share my own person, like I was getting goosebumps. Like you, you said, when, when you, when somebody comes after your kid, right? Like mm -hmm. that mama bear instinct just naturally comes out. And, and specifically recently we, you know, there was a meme where somebody had a, during this whole black Lives matter movement where there was like a poster. And she, when he called out mama, like you called all moms to come. And like, I, I always cry. Like, it's so sad. Right. <laughs> Cause as my nose, I'm a crier. But when you, go and you call out mom it, it is our responsibility to help those people to the extent that we can right um, meaning you start within your household what are you teaching your kids like my 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 kids summer project is literally reading different books from different points of view that are unlike their own because i want them to see somebody else's to your point narrative it starts within the home in educating your own self, including myself, reading my own privilege, like to your point, I, uh, I quote unquote pass as something else. So what duty and responsibility do I, do I have to my Muslim brothers and sisters to help, you know, bridge that gap to the extent that I can, because I come at a, I'm coming at it from a different perspective or a different uh, somebody's perspective or pers you know of me is different than what they would think a natural an another Muslim American would be. So what what where do I stand for that? But I, I definitely appreciate. I just wanted to, to point out that I definitely appreciate that from a mom perspective because we really are um, like a mothering um, podcast, and that was one of the things that I tell my kids that I'm doing this for you. If if talking about these topics that are are kind of taboo, even within the Muslim community, we have to be honest about that. Like, am I paving the way for more discourse and more honesty within our own culture? And I feel like that's very important as well. They get, you know, I have teenagers, I have almost 17 and a 14 and a nine and a seven. So sometimes they get embarrassed, but I think they're secretly proud of me, but I'm just, you know, cause they're like, Oh my God, mom, you're so annoying. But then they're like, Oh, so what are you doing next? But the one thing that you do talk about in the book that I think is worth um, talking about right now is the concept of effective insurgency. What does that mean? And what does that mean for us today? And what are the things that we can do mm -hmm. to bring that about well, for change? Yeah. No, I was just listening to to what you were saying and just, I mean, really thinking about like the journey that it is to to, to try to figure out. I mean, you know, um, you know, James Baldwin has this wonderful quote um, where he says, when you're talking about the Black experience, where he says to be Black and relatively conscious is to be in a constant state of rage, right? And so, you know, to, to, to be... Um, 
you know, I, I grew up like I, I just really want to quickly want to say I, I grew up in an immigrant family who was very focused. And, and this is why I can connect to a lot of the issues that go on within to, in Muslim families. My families came here to America wanting the dream. My father was a refugee from communist China. Um, you know, they wanted the better life. They could come here. They could access things that, you know, could not be accessed back home. This was in the 70s, right? And so I was kind of raised in a little bubble where I didn't have to be exposed to certain types of, you know, hardships in life. I was an only child as well. And so when I got to Berkeley, when I was 18, I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad. You know, it was like the veil got lifted like i i was i realized you know all of these types of things that my parents had endured and things but then i saw kind of the larger scope of injustices and this does go back to the affective insurgency question um you know in terms of um, I, I looked at the world around me, the struggles of other students of color, African-American and indigenous students in particular, and I realized without their contributions, without the contributions of Black freedom fighters, of the civil rights movement, there would be no Immigration Act. There would mm -hmm. be no way uh, for my parents to have even come to this country or have my parents got their jobs through affirmative action. Right, which is a direct result of civil rights legislation. They got jobs at the phone company, you know, a great, you know, kind of steady jobs. They wouldn't be able to have those if it wasn't for civil rights legislation that created affirmative action. And so it, it occurred to me that so much of my privilege, right, was built on the labors and the efforts you know, of other groups who had struggled and strived for so many years and decades and centuries before my parents um, even got here. And so, you know, for these immigrant communities that are coming here and thinking America is a dream, right? It's a possibility, it's hope. They have to re remember that their dreams are based on the labor and struggle and sacrifice and oftentimes extreme sacrifice of other groups of people right? Sacrificing their lives. And so when I was talking about affective insurgency, what I meant was this connection between the ways in which Muslim women in particular are thinking about being Muslim at a certain moment in time and how being Muslim and being a Muslim woman is always something you have to navigate against kind of whatever the cultural landscape of the country is at a particular moment. So I think about 1920s um, urban Chicago, right? African-American women who converted to Islam were very much dealing with this new industrial moment where slavery was not that far in the past, where segregation and extreme inequality and a, and a country in which nobody even knew what Islam was, where Islam was a rejection of white supremacy um, and racism within Christianity. They had to create their identities against that right, against that landscape, against those understandings of race and gender and culture. And in a post 9-11 moment, right, where everyone kind of grows up in the shadow of the war on terror, Muslim women, um, and, and I will say in particular, Muslim women who are identifiably Muslim, who wear a scarf, right, have to create their identities constantly negotiating the stereotypes and ideas that exist about them. Within the, cult, within the cultural imaginary of the country. So this affective insurgency is what I call that feeling in your body of where you have to constantly make a choice to be Muslim against the world, right? Yes. Like you have to mm -hmm. be a Muslim woman against the fact that here's this president on television saying Islam hates us or that we're gonna ban Muslims. You have to be a young person of color and a Muslim against a world that devalues your life, against a world that thinks you wearing a scarf means that you're oppressed by your husband. Like you have to walk into a job interview or a classroom knowing that everybody already thinks these things about you. And you have to feel that. And, I'm, and I argue that that feeling you know, has been the hallmark of what it means to be a Muslim woman, you know, and a Muslim, you know, woman of color primarily, you know, what, what does that feel like to constantly create your identity against all this distortion that exists about who you are? 
And how does that feel? And how do we use that as a source of strength, right? Um, over time. And so that that's what that term was, tr I was trying to capture with that term that I don't, I mean, I've spoken to many Muslim women now, and I think everybody understands that feeling, right? Yeah. That you, you we just didn't have a walk. name for it. So thank you for yeah, naming now it. We, we, now <laughs> we have a name for it. Well, it's my academic term. I just term, it was resentment. You know? <laughs> I well, just yeah, like, I'm just like, angry. Like <laughs> <laughs> or you go into a room and people are saying things, oh, those Muslims or whatever. And it's like, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do? You know, well, like, I had this happen just even last week. I, and this this is why I think it's so funny. If like l the, the doctor um, who was doing my endoscopy and I'm not going to name the practice, but of course he's, he's like, oh, Zeba Hassan. Like, so like, where are you from? Like Iraq, Iran. And I'm like, Chicago, like I'm not from any <laughs> of these blood. places. And literally he's like, no, 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 but no, really, where are you oh, from? I and I just kind of literally looked at him like as he's about to give me anesthesia and I'm like, I'm from Chicago. Like if you're trying to ask me what my ethnicity is or whatever, I'm happy to share that. But are you asking a Mary Smith where she's from? You see what it's, it's these little microaggressions that we as um, people of color, whether you can pass or not pass that we have to deal with. So, and you know, it builds up. Sometimes you get annoyed and I can find, I found myself getting a little angry and having to do some yoga breathing because why do I have to constantly prove myself to you? Why do you just assume I'm not from here because my last name is Hassan. And then you're, you're saying I'm from like, are you from Baghdad? Literally said that to me. And I'm like, of all the places in the world, that's where you would assume I'm from. But that having been said, I, I the one thing I did want to ask you very specifically, because I know we're like, we can probably talk to you for hours and hours and hours and hours because you just bring up so many good points. But you, you mentioned at the beginning of this that you're a mom of three daughters in a very beautifully multicultural Muslim family and how are you what are you doing differently than your parents did for you in raising your children as African Asian American Muslim female specifically in America today with you know all the things that are going on as we speak, literally, as I can't even watch the news, as we speak, how are you raising them differently than perhaps you were raised um, because of their particular um, station or particular Identifiers. place in life? Identifiers yeah. in life. Well, I will give very specific answers because there are certain things that my husband and I decided you know, very early on with our children. As someone who was the kid of immigrants, um, my husband was raised in a very strict Muslim household, um, but but as the mother, you know, I was raised in this immigrant household where I was raised by the TV. My parents were at work, and I realized yeah. as I got older, and, and I'm sure, you know, you can probably relate to these experiences that, you know, you absorb so many of the messages about, you know, who's pretty, who's cool, who's smart, mm. everything. Um, from those images and whether you belong. And it's, it's a very rude awakening when you realize, wait a second, I'm never the main character. You know, yes. I'm the joke. I'm the joke. Or I'm the person, you know, that they laugh at when, you, you know, when you leave the room or, you know, like, you're like, you're wait the a side, second. the side buddy, right? Like, that's always exactly. the case. Like, I'm the sidekick. Why can't I be the, the, the or, per first person? Like, why is that? Or, the I'm case? The butt of, or, or you're the butt or of the, the joke or, you know, whatever. Exactly. Right. So, so I realized that. And so one of the things we decided uh, very early on is that we did not have a television in our house for a mm. very long time. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not perfect. So they had little iPads and they, you know, had little devices and we would watch videos and things. But that was something we very conscientiously did that we did not want to have kind of my parents had the news on all the time. I was always watching some TV was always on. Right. So that was something we were very conscientious about, that we didn't want that in our house. And, and it was actually funny. And, and let me know if we're running you know, short on time or anything. But and, and we really tried to fill their lives with and what we felt like not falsely, you know, you know, happy, you know, happy, happy Muslims, happy people of color kind of messages. But we really <laughs> tried to fill their lives with positive you know, representations of, you know, um, Islam and Muslims and, and people of color and our own cultures. And it was funny because 
I actually had to correct my children at one point because they were, you know, they had only heard good things about Islam and Muslims for so long. I think they were like, you know, eight or nine or, you know, but before Trump. And they were like, well, you know, all Muslims are good, right? You know, and so we had to have this kind of hard conversation where it's like, well, you know, there's bad people everywhere. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, there's good Muslims and bad Muslims too. But I was, you know, I'm happy that they they have a, they they I we tried very hard to create an environment where they were not exposed to the constant din, the overwhelming din of the negativity around who they were, right? So that was one thing, um, you know, that we that we very conscientiously did. Um, let me think. Uh, uh, oh, another thing. I mean, in my particular case, I'm very adamant as a as a scholar of history that my my children are black. I mean, I just you know, like they are uh, they are mixed race and they are proud of you know all sides of their heritage. But again, like when I was talking about affective insurgency, I was trying to say that you have to kind of understand the larger context in which you live. And in this country historically, whether you, you know, the drop of blood, right? You know, we have the three-fifths compromise. You know, when you are mixed race um, and, 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 and part African-American, part Black, you are seen in the eyes of society as Black. And so yes. I, you know, we've made a very conscientious decision to raise them as Black women in the way that they understand what that means. Like that, what that entails, that people see you as black women. Um, I, you know, I have people, I have friends who have, you know, black sons, right? And that, like, again, like that has, that entails a particular um, type of, you know, thoughtfulness around how do you parent these kids, right? So that was also a very conscious decision um, that we had around the children, you know, raising them. And finally, because we come from this really disparate kind of understanding of Islam, my husband and I, you know, we come from different traditions. I come from a much more sort of progressive, feminist, expansive kind of understanding from Islam. He comes from a more traditional, conservative Muslim family. I mean, he has kind of figured out his own way. But we did decide collectively that we wanted to raise them with an Islam that was as expansive and as diverse as Muslims themselves are that there are 1.7 billion Muslims or 1.8 billion, you know, the number keeps changing worldwide, right? And it is not our job. I mean, I, you know, we try to teach them particular traditions and things, but that all of them are practicing Islam in the, con you know, in the context of their lives. And we have so much to learn from all of that. So I always want them to see that they they have so much to connect to. It's not a small kind of marginalized, you know, tight place to be Muslim. It is huge and vast and beautiful. And every single place that they go, they can find different manifestations and expressions of it that they can, you know, engage and learn about and be a part of. Right. And sometimes they'll be hard and sometimes it'll challenge them. Um, but that's all part of what it is. So we, you know, we made an agreement that, you know, it's all Islam. Um, and we want them to be able to find that, seek it out and figure it out in their own improvisation, like who they are. Because I don't even know, you know, they right. have their own, they're mixed race, Chinese, African American, Muslim girls living in Trump's America. They got to figure <laughs> out their own thing. I don't know. Yeah. 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 And I mean, our Islam, the way we practice it is so different than the way our parents did it. Mm -hmm. um, and exactly. I, I just think each generation maybe brings it closer to the actual Islam. We hope that was practiced authentic authentically by uh, Muhammad and his companion. So we can only help peace be upon him. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to close with going back to the question of feminism versus womanism, because womanism was not a term I understood. And I felt so moved by it because I was like, oh, you know, that sounds historically fabulous. But mm -hmm. also, I think ideologically, that aligns more with what I believe is a Muslim woman. So can you talk about, you know, because we have cousins over the ocean. 
who also are mommy and well Muslim, that's not their name, but their um, understanding of feminism is within the context of uh, liberalism. And there's this whole series that they've got that's pretty much anti-feminist. And as someone who has always been a feminist and ascribes to feminism myself, not in the liberal context, but per my understanding, um, I I was not able to connect there, but I was able to connect with your discussion. So if you could just describe that or explain that a little bit for our moms listening um, who are scared to this day of the word feminism and don't want their daughters raised as feminists, don't want their sons raised as feminists. I think this is really important um, for us to teach our children and to realize what the difference is historically and etymologically. Mm -hmm. It's such an important point. So, so I'll say, um, first thing I want to say is there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful book called, I, I think it's called Gender and Islam by Layla Ahmed's yeah. classic book. I, I'm, you're, book. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And she, she says in the very opening pages of the book, uh, Professor Layla Ahmed, who's at um, Harvard Divinity School, she says, you know, there is the Quran and the Hadith that so many of the, you know, scholars over time, the vast majority, actually probably, you know, the major, the, 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 you know, almost 99.9% of have been male um, who have interpreted these texts and given the rulings yes. and the fatwas that we come to understand it through, right? There is the, the text that they have read and the message that we have received. And, and, and this is not to, you know, kind of discount the wisdom and the, you know, teaching of these interpretations. She says, but, there's also always been this separate um, engagement with the Quran and the traditions um, of Islam where women have engaged these words, have read these words and felt something so moving and so stirring that lifted them up as women, right? That gave them, you know, uh, fullness and agency and power and strength. And she says, this is what, you know, um, you know, she wants to look at in her book, what is this other voice that we haven't really looked at or, or you know, that isn't in the volumes of interpretation um, of the Hadith and, you know, all of these things that we, that we are taught in Sunday school or, you know, whatever, right? That there has always been a message of empowerment of women. You know, even, you know, we always cite, you know, Khadija and Aisha and Fatima and, you know, all these strong women. Well, women hear those things. And we connect to that. We say, wow, what, it, what, what would it have been like to have been Khadija in that time? You know, what kind of life did she have? <laughs> well, how amazing, right? What an amazing woman. And we connect to that. And so that, that's one thing, that there already is this voice that is so powerful for women. When in, and I, I guess I'm speaking for myself, engaging Islam for the first time. It's extremely powerful, right? Um, um, you were saying about feminism and womanism. So in the American context, right, you have always had women of color, and I'll speak specifically about African-American women, right? So we can talk about people like Harriet Tubman, or Sojourner Truth, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? African-American women who have been some of the strongest voices in liberation struggles, right, in our history. And so what are they? Are they feminists? Right? What 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 is what is it when Sojourner Truth says, "Ain't I a woman?" Is that a feminist statement? And what we're getting stuck on, what I always point out to people, is when we say, "Okay, we we don't want to be feminists," you're actually not rejecting kind of this idea of women being empowered and being strong and speaking up and leading and advocating. You're reject rejecting a very particular manifestation of white, middle class to upper class, second wave, you know, which is called second wave feminism, feminist discourse that emerged in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that came out, right, as this kind of rejection of the cultural gender norms within white American society at that time. Right. So so when we talk about feminism, we're talking about, oh, uh, women uh, trying to go to work and have the same men as the uh, same jobs as men, um, sexual autonomy, kind of not wanting to raise your own kids. Like this was a particular set of kind of political desires that 
a group of white, you know, like I said, the, they come out, I talk about this in my book, um, the feminine mystique, Betty Friedan, mm. people like that in the 1950s. And so it was a particular, and I hate to say this word because I don't like it when people say the feminist agenda, but, <laughs> but the, it was a particular type of set of political imperatives yes. that feminists of that time um, put forth as kind of the basis for their activism and organizing. At the same time that that was emerging, you had African-American women who were saying, wait a second, all you, you know, white middle-class women who are saying you want to go to work and make your own money and do all this stuff, um, we have already been working. We've been your caretakers, mm -hmm. your nannies, your housekeepers. We've been working in factories. We've been making money for our families. <laughs> we would find it incredibly freeing to stay home and take care yes. of our children. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that would be freedom to us if we could actually. And so, you know, the women of the Nation of Islam said that. And so my kind of issue is so, so that would be kind of called more of a womanist tradition. We're kind of looking at the full experiences of women across racial and ethnic subjectivities and class subjectivities, right? And saying, saying, wait, shouldn't we also include that when we talk about a feminist history, right? When we're talking about, if you're using that word, if it also kind of is about um, talking about women's empowerment and women's history, if we're using that word, that should be a part of that history too. Right. So my kind of insistence on using that word is not to say I want to embrace, you know, these second wave white middle to upper class tenants of what they called feminism. But I'm saying since that word has become common parlance and like a term that we all know and use, we just need to make it again more expansive to say, wait, it includes these efforts of these women of color. It includes the history of Muslim women. Um, Islamic feminism, right, has been a term that people have started to use, saying Muslim women can draw on um, a, Islamic religious texts to advocate for their own empowerment and agency, right? And, and I just think we get caught up. We get caught up on the words. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's a hard one. I know a lot of women that I work with who say, I just don't even use the word feminism anymore. I just say gender justice or something oh, like that because, it, like and that. that's what I actually use in my book. I say gender yeah. justice, right? How could you mm -hmm. not say these women were advocating for gender justice at all times or justice for women at all times? Because people do get caught up in that word. Um, but I, in, the, in a more academic setting, because I work in places where they want to do feminist advocacy, I will argue my butt off and say like, well, feminist advocacy means you need to look beyond your little, you know, bubble of yes. this, you know, white middle class second, you know, particular understanding of what feminis feminism is. Feminism is education for girls in Pakistan or looking at asthma rates for young African-American women or, you know, infant mortality rates. It's all of that should be feminist advocacy. Yeah. So, so that's kind us, of the distinctions. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Finish. I, I, I saw you finishing up your thought. No, that was all I was saying that I, oh. I, I, I am committed to that using that word in certain spaces because I feel like it's a word that's used in policy and to yeah. make changes within certain institutions. And if it, that's the word they're using, then we need to push for them to have a more expansive understanding um, of what feminist advocacy is. Yeah. And, you know, our point in talking about it here was to make sure that our mothers who are afraid of it are not, because there's a place for it, not only in our religion, but, you know, in our social and political structures here in the United States. And you can do both. You don't have to ascribe to what, you know, I'm learning is that second generation or that second wave uh feminist agenda that we all have found problematic, but we've worked, we figured out ways to work around it and to fashion the Islamic feminism that we practice today. So mm -hmm. thank you for all of that. And, you know, thank you for agreeing to come on and sharing uh, some of these important discussions that come out of your book. And I just, I can't urge people enough to, to get it. And we will put the links in our show notes for that and the other articles and authors and scholars that you've mentioned so that we can all, you know, educate our mothers because, you know, going back to 
the quote that Zeba started this entire conversation with. If you educate the moms, you educate the entire household and all of humanity. So we can only hope and pray that our sisters, regardless of how you identify or what you call yourselves or semantics, um, that you all benefited from today's discussion and from every discussion that we have. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. What a pleasure um, to yeah. talk to you and to everyone. Jazakallah khair to everybody. Jazakallah. Yeah. It was great to Assalamu see you alaykum. on camera in a different context. And I love it. Thanks and have a great day, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.